All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for our second webinar of our online learning series, Rooting Congregational Life in the Environment. Uh, today, we'll be covering gardening and food justice. And as we just observed to Bishvat Nong, not too long ago, and spring is coming soon, or at least for some of us, spring already seems to be here in February. Uh, it feels like a fitting time to start thinking about the environment that we build around us. Uh, today, we'll be hearing from Rabbi Michael Bernholz from Barrow Beach, Florida, and he will be discussing how to start a biblical garden and the Jewish values that it can teach. Uh, then we'll hear from Ruth Klein from Dallas, Texas, and Ruth is a master gardener who manages an incredibly successful community garden at her synagogue, Temp Temple Emanuel. And then Robert Neville from Chicago will tell us about his incredible food justice work. The work of these leaders truly embodies the Jewish values of feeding the hungry. And as our tradition teaches us, the human being was placed in the Garden of Eden to till and to tend it. Even from the very beginning, we were commanded to care for the earth and for those who inhabit it with us. A few reminders before we get started, there's a Q&A uh, box in your toolbar. Please feel free to use this throughout the webinar to ask questions of our presenters, and we will answer your questions towards the end. Uh, be sure to put your questions in the Q&A box and not in the chat box. Uh, a recording of this webinar will be posted in the Greening and Environmentalism group in the tent. If you're unfamiliar, the tent is the reform movement social media platform where congregational leaders can share, collaborate, and learn together. If you are not yet a member of the tent, I highly recommend you going to urj.org slash the tent to join. Additionally, the presenters throughout this series will be posting their resources, projects, and experiences in the Greening and Environmentalism group. I invite, I invite all of you to participate in this conversation and to share your own greening projects and questions. Uh, so Rabbi Michael Bernholz ar arrived at Temple Beth Shalom in Faro Beach following his ordination from Hebrew Union College uh, in 2002. Rabbi Bernholz enthusiastically shares his Ruach and Koach, Spirit and Strength, with many diverse generations and facets of the Jewish community. Rabbi Bernholz also enjoys his wide variety of community opportunities to teach and preach Jewish values and wisdom in person at various events or through his column in the Vero Beach Weekly. His hope is to build Temple Beth Shalom into a house of wholeness, completeness, and peace. So Rabbi Bernholz, all you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come and present for this webinar. Um, and so uh, I'm very honored, as I said, to be able to do it. I'm on the east coast of Florida, so whenever I talk about gardening, my gardening experience is different than a lot of people in the, in the country. We had a couple of weeks of winter where it got down into the 50s um, for a little while, maybe into the 40s at night. So all of my seasons are, all, um, are, are very different than a lot of other places. At our congregation, I'm, I'm the only rabbi in my county of 125,000. I have a small congregation of about 200 families, but we have a campus of about five acres. Most of it's wooded, and I have a number of small garden projects that are around our campus. And some of them are projects where I do different types of gardening so that I'm able to use it for teaching. Some are projects that I'm able to use to teach with our religious school and others are um, demonstration gardens where I'm able to have, for example, a, a garden for pollinators, or we have rain barrels set up, or we have compost on our campus to be able to do, live out some of those different values. If we could go back one slide. I don't know if that's possible. Ah, or if I have control, I'm not sure I do. There we go. So this is a list of Jewish values that I have put together that I've been able to find in the garden. And this is work that I've been doing over a number of different years. This is really just a, a quick list um, that in the garden you can do acts of Talmud Torah. You can do study of Torah, finding the different stories of the Torah as you're doing work in the garden. I'll demonstrate that in a few minutes in my, later in my presentation. Where Eretz Vat Kalavu Devash, that Israel is a land flowing in milk and honey, that it's a way to bond with the agricultural experiences of ancient and modern Israel that we have a responsibility to protect and preserve the earth, that we can do justice and righteousness. And I think we'll hear from Robert and Ruth all of the different ways you can do that with your garden. That as we're taking care of the garden, we can think about how we take care of our bodies, that as we sustain the earth, we also have to sustain our physical selves. Hamotzi lechem min haaretz, that we appreciate bread from the earth, and you'll hear that very much in my presentation as I move forward. Hidor mitzvah. For example, in our congregation, I actually am able to grow cotton here 
we also have some olive trees and we've done olive pressing. So instead of lighting candles at our services on Arab Shabbat on Friday night, I have actually created olive oil lamps and we use cotton as part of the wicks. And finally, um, different opportunities for fellowship, for partnership, and for community, whether it's the kids working in, pay, in partnership, whether it's different um, religious groups that are part of our, uh, of our wider community coming to do projects here. There's just different ways to learn about working together and living out all of these different values. This is just some of them. And very often when people ask me about starting a biblical garden, one of the first questions I'm always asking is, which of these values do you want to live out? It doesn't have to be any one of them. It doesn't have to be two of them, but you also don't have to do all of them. And that's probably been my biggest downfall is sometimes I want to do all of them, sometimes at once. And I actually had a reporter who did an article for the Wall Street Journal. If you Google Wall Street Journal Biblical Garden, there's an article about me in the front, from the front page of the Wall Street Journal where I was de de declared the Job of Biblical Gardening. So there are moments where I've had successes and failures. There's moments where I've had a lot of chances to teach. I'm gonna share one of those opportunities I've had to teach. So if we go to the next slide, um, I offer a presentation called With Some Wheat We Can Live Out Torah. And if you go to the next slide, this is a cover of a beautiful book called The Little Red Hen and the Passover Matzah. This is the recipe that's given in the back of that book, and it's a great resource that you can use. And what I want to show you is that you don't have to have a huge garden. You don't have to have acres and acres. You don't have to have square feet and square feet. You don't have to have a huge religious school. One of the things I often say is that with one pot, you can do a lot. And so I'm going to show how you can use one pot, one planter, a, a few little cups, and you can live out an amazing garden experience based upon, in part, living out what happens in this book, The Little Red Hen and the Passover Matzah. Next slide. So what these are, these are called seed tapes. And what it is is toilet paper. And um, go back, thank you. Um, this is toilet paper, and that is wheat seed on it. You take some wheat seed that you can get through Amazon and all sorts of different providers. Um, you, can, you take the wheat seed, you take some Elmer's glue, and you can see there are different designs and there are different words that are written on them. And what we did at a Tubish Thought program is we had some different midot. We did have some different values. We had, so we gave opportunities for our young people to be able to um, write their name, to write a value, to draw a design. I then, once they dried, we were able to take this toilet paper. You just lay it out in the garden. I put a thin layer of earth over it and my wheat field started to grow up and we were able to implant values into the garden even as we went. So the next slide. This is a pot of wheat. This is just sitting on the back deck, um, uh, the back deck of, our, of my office, where my office is. And these are a number of pieces of wheat. What I did is I had this pot sitting outside um, of our sanctuary, of our building. When we came out after Friday night, I was just giving people a few different piece, seeds of wheat and we, as a, as a congregation, planted this wheat. This wheat isn't necessarily gonna grow into wheat that I'm gonna be able to harvest. It might, it might not, but in being able to plant it and see it growing, at least the people who are coming to the synagogue are seeing what wheat looks like when it grows. And so the next slide. This is one of our wheat planters. You can see it's just in a garden. You can see the palm tree in the back. And this is just a three by one planter and you can see that it has little heads of wheat on it. This is from our first year that was a number of years ago. And so the next slide. And here are some of the wheat heads. I have never actually successfully harvested my wheat. I've gotten a few heads of wheat. Typically, right before I'm ready to harvest it, a squirrel or rabbit, somebody keeps coming and getting it from me. But if I've got some of these wheat heads, even if I don't get to harvest them, our kids, as we're, or, or, and I've done this with adults as well, they're getting to see the wheat growing and get a sense of what they're working with, which will be important in just a moment. Um, we can keep going. So this is, whoops, go back one. Thanks. Um, so this is, um, on the right is my son, and on the left is me, and I was, had a boot um, about a year and a half ago. I had broken a bone in my foot when we were doing this. But this is some of the wheat that we harvested, and it's also some decorative wheat that I purchased. 
Um, and part of it is that not only do you have to, you don't have to always grow everything. We have olive trees, but haven't been able to grow olives. And I have to ship the olives in in order to do our olive pressing. In the same breath, sometimes I'm able to grow some wheat that I'm able to work with with our students or with our adults, or I have to go online and I order a, a bundle of decorative wheat, but you can still get the whole experience. So even if I only have grown three or four heads of wheat, I can still show everybody the different parts of it. So that's one of the things that I've done as I've done this presentation, I've done this experience, is, is supplement at each step. So here's my son. <laughs> from a couple of years ago, and he is just by hand threshing and winnowing. So we were just taking a wheat head and breaking it apart with our hands. And if we go to the next slide, this is me at, Un at um, Union for Reform Judaism Camp Coleman in Cleveland, Georgia. I'm the campscape rabbi there. And this is a Shabbat program we did, mandatory optionals. You can see in the foreground, there are some of the decorative wheat. Um, and those are little pieces of, of canvas cloth. And that is me making a very odd face as I am working with the students and they're taking rocks and mallets and we were just smashing the wheat. We were um, threshing the wheat to separate the wheat grains from the heads. And you'll see to the right, there's a bowl next to it and that'll come important in just a second as we turn the slide. Um, so when you're hitting it, whether you're breaking it apart by hand <laughs> or pounding it on with a rock, by, with a rock you're separating the grain from the chaff. And on the side is a quote from Isaiah that I'll make you a threshing, uh, threshing um, a new thresher with many spikes and making hills of chaff. You shall winnow them and wind shall carry them off. This was from a half draw. I was starting with a bat mitzvah student the week after her class did this program and this experience, which was amazing because she had threshed and winnowed and had that experience of feeling what it meant to create chaff and create the grains and separate the grain from the chaff and then she's reading it in her Torah portion, in her Haftarah portion, excuse me. To me, it becomes vital. There are so many different agricultural images and values that happen in Torah to be able to teach it, to be able to handle it, to be able to see it, whether it's spinning, whether it's pressing olives, whether it's harvesting something, to be able to see these garden experiences, to then see them and experience them when they're reading Torah, just brings the Torah to life. So the next slide. So this is me with another set of campers, um, and there is the bowl. And what does she do? She is winnowing, and if you, um, she is just blowing air into it. And we had chaff flying all over. And I think I said that if your chaff isn't in your hair, then you're not blowing hard enough. We all got a great chuckle out of that. And if you go to the next slide, you can actually see in her hair is some of the chaff, and I'm just pouring out into her hands um, some of the wheat grain that she separated. And then they went to the next station, so the next slide. And this is, in the bowl, is some of the wheat grain. And they're just taking stones, and they were just grinding it by hand. And there's my son doing the same thing. He was just grinding with it. And you're making whole wheat flour. How many of us don't even, we think about bread or flour and don't even think about where it comes from. So you're getting to go from a whole head of wheat, threshing and winnowing and grinding to be able to see all of the steps of the process and how much labor and time it takes. So when we got to this stage at Camp Coleman, we had some extra wheat grain that was there. So they had what they threshed and winnowed. We had some extra, they got to do some grinding in the next slide. And we actually had a metal grinder there as well. So they were doing some with stones, but I think it was $20 on Amazon, we were able to get the grinding. Go, can you go back one, please? Thank you. So they were actually getting to grind and they were making the flour. Um, and then the next slide, and you can see this is the whole length of the table. In the foreground is me visiting with one of the young ladies getting her ready to thresh and winnow, then was the grinding. And at the far end, there's a woman in an orange hat and there's also a gray shirt. And they were taking flour, some of it that the campers had created, some of it was from an extra container of flour, and they were making matzah. So they were taking and making dough and rolling it out and then cooking it right there. And if you go to the next slide, that's me threshing and winnowing while I'm eating matzah. So you can see the matzahs in my mouth I was chewing while I was eating. Um, I was eating while I was trying to teach. And that was, the, to me, is the beauty of it. We were going in the course of about 15 or 20 minutes with these stations, going from full heads of wheat that they could also at the same time see growing in the garden 
to being able to eat the matzah you know, all in one step. And for me, the food justice part of this is that they're seeing how much energy and time goes into going from planting a garden to harvesting in the garden to being able to work with the materials, what's the resources coming out of the garden to be able to take what we eat. And I have that incredible question, how much wheat does it take and how much labor does it take to make even one slice of bread? And to me, that becomes a vital question in food justice. If we're able to teach that, whether you have one pot of wheat or you're able to have fields of wheat, if we can give our adults and our young people that chance to really think about what it means to, to go through that whole process and the amount of time and resources, that it makes them and all of us more appreciative, <coughs> excuse me, appreciative of the time and energy it takes to the food that we eat and we're more thoughtful of what, we're, what we are consuming and when we are consuming it. So I can show you that piece of garden pro project. We're gonna hear a number of other types of garden projects and I hope in, in your synagogues that you realize that you don't have to have a huge garden in order to be able to teach these types of values and experience, not just teach the values, truly to experience them in a very hands-on way. And I have other projects are about pollinators, um, with nature, with water. We just did, I just did one teaching about maror and karpas, about sweet and bitter herbs for Passover. And I'm happy to, to share any of these um, types of programs. So thank you very much for giving me a chance to show you our weed experiences from my synagogue and from Camp Coleman. I'm happy to, to field questions or to be able to share in this discussion. Great, thank you so much, Rabbi Bernholz. Um, like he said, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A box and we will get to them at the end. Um, but now we're gonna move on to Ruth Klein. Ruth is a native of Dallas and a member of Temple Emanuel there. She has been employed as a physical therapist since 1978 and continues to do home care PT on a part-time basis. Um, in 2009, Ruth became certified as a Dallas County Master Gardener. She helped start the, temp the Temple Emanuel Community Garden, which the congregation built in spring of 2012. She has served as a garden leader since that time. Uh, Ruth currently consults with a garden she designed for a Dallas immigrant community and volunteers on the Master Gardener Speakers Bureau, and she speaks on vegetable and water-wise gardening. Thank you. Do you hear me? Okay. Do you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I was going to talk more about um, how we uh, started our garden, so go ahead. I'm going to, I have a lot of slides, and you can just go ahead and keep changing change it. Um, first of all, when we, a uh, girlfriend of mine, she, um, we have a, had a rabbi who is um, into uh, social justice and uh, community organizing. And so the year, uh, our congregation is huge. I think there's like uh, 2,000 families or something like that. We have, I think, six rabbis or clergy people on it. So it's not the main uh, thing of the temple, but the year we did start it, the main, the focus of the temple was environmental responsibility. So that worked out good, so you switch. So what um, we did is uh, we uh, made a proposal to the board and um, the rabbi helped put together, um, connect it with Judaism, with um, uh, scripture. And so if you'll change the slide. Um, he, as part of community organizing, we, uh, he had us get, get together and brainstorm, switch. Um, and so some of our goals were to uh, just just uh, to respond to our biblical uh, to to well we have a um, yeah this is hard to connect this um, we we um, one of the things the temple is involved in is uh, there's a, a a kind of an immigrant community close to where our temple is and so that we have a lot of volunteers and we help support a food pantry so one of our goals was to provide for the food pantry and there's there's uh, some of the Swiss chard we had done and then the next one. Uh, we, uh, uh, to be a place for multi-generation, uh, to get kids involved in it, and then to, um, to help to uh, contemplate environmental responsibility, switch, and then um, keep switching. We built it in 2012. Luckily, one of the temple members is a landscape architect, so he designed it. And uh, we started out, we, we, you know, we were trying to think how much are we going to uh, donate. And we started out um, having um, 
three, we were trying to cre create community. So we had three family members or three, or three different families in each bed. And then three farmers rose that we were going to uh, donate to the um, to all, 100 percent to the pantry. And what we decided is that we people would give a corner of their field, 25 percent. And what we found though is most everybody wanted to give pretty much everything um, of what they had done. But uh, can you keep going? Uh, yeah, we we met on Sunday mornings. What I found um, was it was stressful. I mean, people had, people had trouble deciding what they wanted to plant in their beds. Most of the gardeners were brand new to gardening and like one woman wanted to plant mint in a bed, which then it would have become a mint bed. And I mean, so there were times when I felt like a marriage counselor or something. So switch. <clears throat> um, we, to me, one of the most spiritual experiences in my whole life is gardening. I mean, it's just being in the dirt and, um, being able to connect it with Judaism. And so the rabbi put together a prayer for us, and we're very good about this. Every every uh, week we, we gather together and recite the prayer together. And it's just that sense of what we're doing is, uh, we're doing it for Adonai. You know, but there's, uh, there's a real sense of the spiritual connection. Next. Um, one woman who is a teacher in the religious school, she taught um, a religious, we meet during the time of a religious school, so she taught a class on um, connecting Judaism with uh, the garden. And so uh, the kids would come out to the garden during the religious. And then we have a, a pre B'nai Mitzvah program also next. So we did a lot of programming. One of the things too, uh, our temple has got into the big questions um, where we have, uh, because it's such a large community, it's a way that um, for us to get to know each other. And this has been really neat for us because I found that we had the same people coming every Sunday, but people would come to garden and then they would go home. And so what we've done once a month, we meet and have, um, have a, a conversation about the, the, um, the big questions that are, that are done. And that's really helped us to grow closer. It really feels like a family. Next. Um, we, we did this just recently, a Tuba Shabbat Seder. Next and providing flowers for Shabbat. That's been a nice thing to do. And then we uh, collaborate with the Dallas County Master Gardeners, which um, several of us, actually some of one of, one of the people's now. One of the things, um, growing, uh, in the next slide, growing, um, it, Texas is like one of the hardest places to grow vegetables, but a nice thing that I've learned from some community gardeners here is that um, a lot of tropical grow, uh, vegetables are so easy to grow here. We're, we're real committed to doing using organic, um, and so these are red noodle beans and um, snake melons, and it's really neat because a lot of the people, recipients at the food pantry are from Asian communities, and so the things that I, I some of them, I don't even know how to uh, cook them, but, but what we've, we've been told is people really enjoy them, and they're so much easier to grow than a lot of the traditional vegetables in Dallas. Next. And then um, like one woman, she wanted, she uh, saw a program on, on PBS about, um, about the, mod, the plight of the monarch. So she donated some, some, um, uh, you know, some butterfly plants, um, uh, milkweed, that's that one. And then we, we use, try to use, comp we compost and uh, use other environmental good. And then uh, next. And then um, I went and visited Robert, who's going to speak next. I visited his garden um, with the American Community Gardening Association. And um, he had, I can't tell, I'm so grateful to him. One, one, one thing, he really inspired me. Um, th their whole temple is just, uh, they're growing food on it instead of grass, which I found really inspiring. But he encouraged me to, instead of having individual plots, to go to team, team um, gardening. So all of us are gardening the um, same thing. So next, next slide. Um, we, uh, we tripled our, because I'm doing all the garden planning and we're all working together as a team, um, uh, we're, uh, we tripled our output. And uh, the, the sense of the infighting and the um, stress of the garden, it's all gone away. It's like we're all working towards the same goal. And it had a huge, um, just it's more like a kibbutz or something like a huge change in, in the, in the uh, spirit of it. So then the last slide is um, we, uh, uh, one of the Temple families has given us a generous donation. So we have, you know, just to me, uh, grass is like the biggest waste of space. And, and a lot of our Temple grounds have, are grass. In fact, this one area we're going to expand to, they just used it once a year for, uh, for overflow parking for the um, high holy days. So actually we're going to expand into that part. And one thing we're planning to do is to uh, partner with the international, we're looking into it, maybe more complicated, but we, we're hoping to um, partner with the International Rescue uh, Commission and um, uh, 
they have a program called the New Roots Program. And so what we're going to do is uh, put aside some beds so that they can actually come and grow their own food in it. So it's very exciting. It's one of the, I, I think this is, being a part of this, I've been, um, uh, I'm not the official leader now, but I, I continue to lead the, the actual garden part on Sunday mornings. It's been one of the most fulfilling filling things I've ever done. And, and the, um, one of my, a big goal too, is feeling a part of a community. And um, the, the, that's been really powerful. It's just feeling like we're all, we're all working on a spiritual goal of um, helping to feed the hungry. And um, so, so I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed it. And that's it. It is, I mean, uh, I was, I'm, uh, this is one other thing I was, I remember I was start. I start the, um, start the tomato seeds at my home because it's, uh, it's easier to do it than trying to drive up there and keep them wet. And I just, that tiny little uh, seed, it's a, just a miracle to me still that it becomes a big tomato plant. And then um, if the squirrels don't get them all, um, you, you end up with tomatoes. So um, it is, it's really the spiritual connection has been really powerful. That's it. Thank you so much, Ruth. Um, now we're going to have Robert. Uh, he is an architect and urban farmer and pioneer in the food justice movement. He sits on the board of advocates for urban agriculture and is the immediate past president of KAM Isaiah Israel Congregation in Chicago. In 2009, Robert founded the award-winning nationally recognized Interfaith Food Justice and Sustainability Program at his congregation. The program is focused on transforming unproductive urban spaces into micro farms and food forests, improving access to fresh food, teaching urban agriculture and sustainability skills, and advocating for healthy food systems and responsible land, energy, and water use. Well, thanks very much for the introduction, and it's a great honor to be both with the rabbi and with Ruth, who last uh, time I did a webinar for the URJ, uh, Ruth was on that webinar. So if that was three or four years ago, if I'm not mistaken, uh, if that holds true for the future, then some of you who are listening to this webinar now will be doing webinars in a few years, we can only hope. Um, so I am, uh, as, as was said, an architect and urban farmer. I have been a member of KMIZA Israel, which was founded 170 years ago in 1847. If I've done my math right, it is a 300 member congregation in Hyde Park, and we are directly across the street as many of you might know from President Obama's Chicago home. Uh, the photograph you're seeing, the first photograph, is in fact probably less than 100 yards from the President's home, is outside our historic uh, landmark building, a 1923 Central Dome Synagogue. And uh, this is a, a uh, shepherd, uh, stewarding uh, a, uh, an heirloom corn seed. So, I want to start, if I may, by asking some questions, and I'm hoping that uh, you all will respond in the, uh, send us uh, your responses, but I want to start by defining terms. So my understanding is that this webinar is food justice, how your congregation can feed the hungry through Jewish values. So the first question I would encourage you to think about is what is your definition of food justice? What does food justice mean? And I'd like you to send in your responses to that, and I will share with you ours at KMIZ Israel uh, in a bit. Uh, the next uh, is the word congregation. How do you define your congregation? It is just your members. It is your neighborhood, your larger community. The next word that intrigues me is feed. What does feed the hungry mean? Feed who? The predators, the pollinators, your congregants? Feed the body, the mind, the soul, the spirit. You should understand that, and I'm going to talk mostly about this, actually feeding folks and what that means. Uh, if you can grow one pound of food per square foot in a four-season environment, uh, you're looking at if you grow a thousand, uh, if you have a thousand square foot uh, garden, uh, you will take out about a thousand pounds of food a year, which is enough to feed eight people for four months from July through October. In a, in a climate such as Chicago's. So it is a tall order to think you're going to feed the hungry uh, through Jewish values or not in a congregational garden. Um, and what in fact does hungry mean? Hungry for what? For calories, for ideas, for enlightenment? And Jewish values. Can you feed the hungry through Jewish values? So what I wanna uh, uh, 
share with you is that we do not at KMIZ Israel, we do not have a, we do not have a garden, but rather an urban farm. And uh, through uh, and we do urban farming through traditional row crops and food forests. It's very difficult, both uh, as, uh, in terms of money, arable land, time, labor, knowledge, weather, predators, to provide significant quantities of food through a community or a congregational garden. There are other ways to do this to, to this end, and I will share with you now the different components of our program in Chicago and actually rate the level of difficulty of each and then encourage you to choose which aspects are best suited for your congregation. And I'm actually going to rate each one of these into their degree of difficulty. So if you'd switch to the next slide, please. That's actually uh, me uh, uh, just finishing up harvesting sweet potatoes this last, uh, this last uh, uh, October. So what does it take to deliver, to harvest and deliver four tons of food per year, which is what we typically shoot for, about 8,000 pounds of food from, an urban, from urban sites, which is enough food to really provide uh, uh, adequate produce for 23 adults for a year. That's it, 8,000 pounds, 23 adults. So if you go to the next slide, please. So the next several slides are uh, uh, show pictures of our micro farms and food forests, and from them, we have an annual yield of about two tons or about 4,000 pounds. And you can keep advancing. Well, wait, actually stay there for one, go back for one moment. So that is uh, what we call the 1080. It's out on Hyde Park Boulevard. You're along a bus line. Uh, this is uh, all of the arable land uh, has been, has been uh, cultivated at KM Isaiah Israel, as well as at two churches uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, so you can advance one. Uh, that is a food forest looking in the direction of President Obama's house. You can see in the foreground two pear trees, uh, 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 service berry, uh, hazelnut. Uh, um, is entirely a perennial food forest. The next slide, please. Uh, and, and at a United Church of Christ, about four blocks away, all the food that we grow is grown within a half mile radius and deliver it to, to a hot meal program and Chicago Housing Authority uh, Senior Center within a mile of where the food is growing. So you can see these are traditional row crops uh, as opposed to uh, food forests. Next slide, please. Uh, St. Paul and Redeemer, an Episcopal church. Uh, it's an ornamental food producing garden. Uh, it, it, we take out about, they harvest about 1,700 pounds of food from this site every year. Uh, it is designed to mimic the plan of their church. There's a baptismal font in the front and a Eucharist table in the back. Next slide, please. Now, we also have something called the White Rock Gleaning Program, which generates about 1,000 pounds of food a year. The, if the micro farms and food forests, if 10 is the most difficult uh, uh, way toward food, producing food, then I would rate food forest and micro farm to be an 11. The White Rock Gleaning problem, Program, I would probably put it a five. So uh, there are community gardens, large community gardens with uh, a mile or so of the synagogue, and we uh, glean there. We harvest the untended plots uh, on Sunday afternoons. One of the reasons why I think that growing food at your congregation is, is so difficult and has such a low rate of success is that in a standard community garden of one acre with 100 plots in September, uh, during the height of the harvest season in Chicago, probably 80% of those plots go untended. It is a very, growing food at your congregation has a very low success rate. Uh, Ruth uh, Project in Dallas is a spectacular uh, example of, of success, but there aren't a lot of them. Next slide, please. This is a, a picture of folks. A gleaning at a community garden uh, on a Sunday afternoon, harvesting the untended plots. Next slide, please. This is what Chicago typically looks like in the winter. Uh, we cannot grow food. I'm really quite envious of my, the, the other two, uh, my other two colleagues in this panel, that they are uh, can grow four seasons. This is what Chicago should look like in 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 the, uh, January, February, March. Uh, so we uh, have, instead of collecting canned foods on the high holidays, we collect money. We have an arrangement with uh, local farmers who uh, through, once a month uh, we uh, purchase 500 pounds of storage crops 
Around here, that means apples, onions, carrots, and sweet potatoes. And next slide, please. We go to the community garden, pick up those apples and sweet potatoes, onions, and carrots. Next slide, please. And deliver them during the lean months to our recipients who would otherwise receive food uh, during the growing season. Next slide, please. And that is another great way that generates somewhere in the order of a ton of food per year. So the White Rock Gleaning and the High Holiday Fresh Food Initiative produce three quarters of the three quarters, almost three quarters of the amount of food we can grow on our quarter of an acre. Uh, the Fruit and Nut Tree Planting Initiative, we have an arrangement with several organizations in Chicago that donate trees, and every year we try and increase the urban orchard in Chicago with fruit and nut trees by 30 to 40 trees. Uh, this is, I would rate, the, if, I, if I would rate the micro farms and food forests as a 10 or an 11, the gleaning at a five, the High Holiday Fresh Food Initiative, level three in terms of ease of, of doing. Uh, the fruit and nut tree planting, I would put it a four. Next slide, please. We also, there, there we are planting the planting a black walnut tree on site at the synagogue. Next slide, please. We also do annually a food justice and sustainability weekend in honor of Dr. King. And we have a seven year uh, program of, of tying that into climate change. And uh, I would rate this as a nine. This is a, this is a weekend long event, free and open to the public. If we generally see an audience of about 300, uh, and it's a food and echo justice weekend. Next, please. We run, and that's the, this theme this year was climate change and water. Next slide, please. We also run a farm and food forest school. I'm not sure what happened to the text on this slide, but we run a farm and food forest school. Next slide, and, oh, wait, stay there. Go back, uh, the red brick house over their head is President Obama's home. Uh, this is a morning harvest uh, uh, from farm and food forest school. They're gonna go inside and learn how to prepare a vegan lunch. Uh, next slide. Uh, that's uh, Farm and Food Forest School harvesting out on the 1080. Uh, and again, this is a tight urban site. And last slide, and next to the last slide, is what we call the edible bima. So this I would rate at a number three, and I would encourage all of you to do that. Rather than uh, decorate uh, our bima for the high holidays or for B'nai Mitzvah or for any uh, event, rather than using cut flowers flown in from faraway places, uh, we, next slide please, we decorate our bima with uh, um, the, the, the morning harvest uh, before the uh, high holy days or before the event. So it's an example, that's what it looked like Rosh Hashanah a few years ago. That food was grown right outside uh, the con right outside the building there. The Jewish values, uh, al-tashit, certainly transforming, uh, wasting nothing is uh, how we feel it applies to our transforming lawns into food production, our gleaning program, and the High Holiday Fresh Food Initiative, uh, then I would say in terms of uh, sustainable land use, we are motivated by the land is mine, you are but strangers resident with me. As far as our food forests and our seven-year cycle of climate change weekends, we have Shemitah plays a big role in what we do uh, in our sustainable design. Uh, and I would say that diversity and inclusiveness uh, has a big impact on the fact that this is an interfaith effort. Uh, it is, most of our work is volunteer driven. About half of our farmers are members of the congregation, half are from the community. Uh, we also have a paid farm manager and a school director. So um, that's, the, that's the sum of it. Uh, and I think that uh, I take very seriously this title, uh, How Can Your Congregation Feed the Hungry Through Jewish Values? And the other title of the webinar was Gardening and Food Justice. I think that growing food on your site is admirable. Uh, if you have the ingenuity and the stick to itness of Ruth, uh, you will get it done. Otherwise, I would encourage you, if you really want to feed the hungry, to, to go about uh, gleaning and decorating your bima with storage crops that you can buy from local farmers and uh, consider uh, planting fruit and nut trees. Great, thank you so much, Robert. Um, so we're gonna move on to the question and answer portion of the webinar. Um, if you have any remaining questions, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A box. Um, we have one question for Robert. Um, do you 
do any of the prep for food besides growing. We have chop-ins where different groups come in to process the food received from different folks in the community. So do you do any of the food prep? So that's a, gr that's a great question. Uh, we typically do not, and there's, uh, there's some uh, reasons for that. Um, in Illinois, uh, we are covered by what's called the Good Samaritan Law, and we can provide uh, uh, raw food to the recipients, uh, but uh, we, we uh, do not in any way prep that food before delivery. Uh, that is, in the scale of farming that we do, that, uh, that puts us into an entirely different uh, realm, uh, and it is uh, not really part of our, uh, the scale, and also the scale of the food that we generate is so great that it would be very difficult for us to add into that uh, cooking and prepping. So it is, it is delivered. Uh, carrots and beets are rinsed off so that we're not taking a lot of soil with us, uh, but it is, uh, but by and large, the food is delivered uh, uh, as, it, as it's harvested. Great, thank you. Um, so a question for Ruth, um, how did your congregation find funding for your garden or how do you continue to fund your garden? Um, you know, it's amazing. Once you get it up and running, it, it doesn't take a whole lot of money. I mean, I'm, uh, we have like a, a budget, I think our budget's like 3,000 a, a year now and um, it, we don't use, uh, we, don't, we don't, definitely don't use it uh, up. Um, it's, it's funded through the Social Justice Council at our temple. And uh, like I said, we had a, a family that gave a, uh, one, of, uh, one of the members of the family is, uh, is one of the gardeners, and they gave a really generous uh, donation to help uh, build, to do the garden expansion. Great, thanks. And then we have another question for Robert. Um, how does the interfaith work play into your urban farm, or how did you develop those partnerships? Well, a, a, again, a great question, and I think uh, essential to the work that we do. Um, we, uh, I would say a vast majority of food relief and food justice in this, uh, in this country takes place at houses of worship, uh, whether they are actually uh, hot meal programs at churches or pantries at churches or synagogues or mosques. Uh, so to start with, it would be nearly impossible for it not to be interfaith. But I think the, we have found that uh, from the get-go, it was our intention to be a part of the community. Uh, and, uh, and so to truly be a part of the community, and especially to provide food for those in need, uh, you really need to be part of the large community. Uh, this is not a Jewish or a Christian or a Muslim problem. Uh, the sustainable land use portion of our project is not is not a Jewish uh, matter only, and for it to be truly uh, a sustainability program, it needs to be interfaith. And and it, we are by nature, um, I mean by definition, really working with uh, other uh, religions. It would be it is it is a key component of the work that we do. Great, thank you. Um, so that's all the questions on here. There was a question about the recording for the first webinar, which is available in the tent, um, if you want to check for it there. And then Rabbi Bernholz has an announcement before we wrap up. Um, <clears throat> so one of the projects that I'm working on is potentially doing a, a local carbon sequestration bank, which fits with all of the different larger environmental questions that we've been he hearing. So if anyone is interested in, um, in, in hearing what we're doing as that's starting to come together, they can certainly contact me either through the tent or um, I'm sure the RAC also has my contact information. Also, I have put together a number of different Jewish uh, synagogue gardens and also uh, camp gar Jewish camp gardens we have a Facebook group where we're starting to share resources, interact, everything from Mitzvah Garden KC to a congregation up in Maine and then folks in South Florida as well. So if anyone is interested in being part of that Facebook group, you just have to reach out to me through the tent. 
Thank you, Rabbi Bernholz, um, and thank you everyone for joining us, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, please check the Greening and Environmentalism group in the tent for resources and information. Um, feel free to post any unanswered questions there, and I will also be posting the panelists' contact information, and it will be emailed, uh, emailed out along with the recording of the webinar. Um, also, please join us next month for our webinar, All About the Environment, How to Engage Your Congregation, on March 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, we will be talking about how you can bring environment-themed programming to your congregation. Thanks again.